NASCAR has been around for more than 75 years. Yeah, that's a pretty long time. Here's what it looked like when it first started, and here's what it looks like now. So, uh, how did we get here? Well, it all started in January of 1919, when the 18th Amendment outlawed the production and sale of alcohol. Like any true American, those with business savvy found their way around the law. Let's build distilleries hidden in the backwoods of North Carolina, no one will ever see them. And so they did. Working at night, the only way they could see was the moon itself. So their alcohol started being called moonshine, and these moonshiners needed a way to transport their contraband without looking suspicious. Hey, why don't we put a giant engine and beefed up transmission in this regular old family car? Sounds great. And thus, the first stock car was born. To the naked eye, nothing was different, but underneath the body, these things were full-on race cars, with obviously some contraptions in the back to hold the moonshine, of course. Oh look, prohibition is over. What do we do with these super fast cars we have? Uh, why don't we race them? And so they did. Yeah, but where? How about these abandoned horse racing tracks? Hmm, sounds good. And it was that point in which the oval became the preferred track type for stock car racers. Daytona Beach, Florida became a hotbed for racing, with guys like Bill France taking part. They raced one straightaway up the literal beach, and then down Highway A1A with these ruts of sand making up the turns. Stock car racing grew, but race promoters rarely paid up, safety was non-existent, and it was still pretty unorganized. Yeah, this is cool, but can we have some guaranteed money, a point system, and perhaps make a real living out of this? Say no more, says Bill France in 1947. He had visions of this being a big spectator sport, so just decided to start his own league. The first ever NASCAR Cup race was held on June 19, 1949 in where else but Charlotte, North Carolina. And the winner was disqualified for running illegal springs. Well, I guess NASCAR hasn't changed that much after all. The series mostly raced on dirt tracks until this guy named Harold went to the Indy 500 and was like, hey, if they can do this in some neighborhood in Indiana, I can do this back home in Darlington, South Carolina. And so he did, and in 1950 the first ever paved track of over a mile was built, with the first running of the Southern 500. It was also at this race where drivers discovered banking. Darlington had it as a safety feature to slow cars before hitting the wall, but the drivers were like, hmm, it's just way faster to drive on it, and thus the idea of a stock car on a paved high bank speedway was forever ingrained in history. The first decade of racing was dominated by the likes of Herb Thomas, the Flock family, Buck Baker, and Lee Petty. Mechanics like Smokey Eunuch and Junior Johnson set a new standard when it came to fiddling with the rulebook, even coming up with outright cheats yet being clever enough to kind of get away with it, a lot of the time. I could do an hour-long video on some of their stories, that's how deep it went. 1959 saw the arrival of NASCAR's most iconic track, Daytona. With 31 degrees of banking, 2.5 miles in length, and a trioval shape, it was nothing like the world had ever seen before. And immediately, the February race, the Daytona 500, became the most prestigious event. Soon, car makers started getting more involved. As the sport grew, auto executives were like, Hey, this is the perfect marketing campaign. Win on Sunday, sell on Monday became the mantra for Detroit's auto industry, with GM, Ford, and Chrysler all committing big money by the 1960s. This reached a boiling point in 1969 when Chrysler took their Dodge Charger, slapped a cone-shaped nose and enormous wing on it, and called it a day. So did it work? Yes. It became the first car in history to do a 200 miles an hour closed course average lap speed at Talladega. Oh yeah, Talladega. Think Daytona, but add two more degrees of banking, make it an eighth of a mile longer, and put the start finish line after the trioval. Bill France sure did like his big super speedways. Of course, the Dodge Charger was too good and quickly got banned, and the days of the cars being copies of their road versions was coming to an end. These were now fully prepared race cars with a road car body style hung on them. The sport was now becoming big business, and in 1972, Winston became the title sponsor of the Cup Series. They upped the prize money, cut out all the midweek races on short tracks that only like 14 cars showed up to, and renamed the Grand National Series as the NASCAR Winston Cup Series, starting NASCAR's modern era. The old point system that determined the champion based on money and paying more points for bigger races was scrapped for 1975, and every race was worth equal points, making the Drivers' Championship more important than before. The 1970s saw the arrival onto the national stage of the sport's biggest stars. As more race highlights got shown on TV, names like Richard Petty, David Pearson, Cale Yarborough, Bobby Allison, and Darrell Waltrip took center stage. Petty and Pearson are the only two drivers in history with triple-digit win counts, while Cale, Bobby, and DW each have over 80. The sport for much of the middle part of its history was dominated by these guys, and they grew large fan bases. All of this came to a head at the 1979 Daytona 500, the most important race in NASCAR history. 
For the first time, CBS would broadcast a 500 mile race live thanks to the effort of one Ken Squire, the voice of NASCAR. So you might ask, what was so special about this race? Well, the east coast of the country was snowed in, and since there were like three channels back then, the Daytona 500 was the only real thing on TV. Combine that with a ferocious battle between Yarborough and Donny Allison, Bobby's brother, a last lap crash, Richard Petty winning his sixth Daytona 500, and a subsequent fight in the infield, there were too many storylines to count. This iconic ending set the stage for NASCAR to expand outside its home as a southern showcase. With the help of CBS and eventually a little known cable station named ESPN, the sport took off like a rocket into the 1980s, a decade which saw the emergence of two more of NASCAR's biggest legends. Dale Earnhardt may have won the Winston Cup title in 1980, but when he signed with former driver Richard Childress to drive his number 3 car, things took off considerably. While Dale was always at home beaten and banging on a short track, Bill Elliott was the opposite. Bill's red and white Ford Thunderbird contrasted with Earnhardt's Monte Carlo, but each dominated in their own way. Elliott's Melling Racing team produced enormous speeds at the big tracks, allowing him to dominate at Daytona and Talladega. At Talladega in 1987, Elliott set NASCAR's all-time lap record with an average speed of 212.809 miles an hour in qualifying. Unfortunately, in this race, Bobby Allison's engine cut his right rear tire down, sending him into the catch fence with fans lucky to escape. After this, the era of unrestricted speeds was over, with the restrictor plate put in for every race at Daytona and Talladega. This created pack racing at the big tracks, which had the unintended consequence of big accidents involving 15 plus cars. I wonder if they came up with a nickname for those big ones. Oh yeah, they did, it's uh, uh, the big one. Anyway, NASCAR passed into the early 90s with a new crop of stars. Petty, Yarborough, Pearson, and Allison were all done, but we still had the likes of Earnhardt, Elliott, Davey Allison, Rusty Wallace, Darrell Waltrip, Terry Labonte, Alan Kowicki, Richard's son Kyle Petty, and Jeff Bodine. The amount of competition really showed in 1992, with six drivers eligible to win the title at the final race in Atlanta. With his knowledge of the bonus point system, Kowicki, the last true owner-driver, claimed the title over Bill Elliott by staying out a lap longer before his last pit stop to secure more laps led, which gave him the championship even though Elliott won the race. 1993 would alter the course of NASCAR history for better and for worse. While Dale Earnhardt and Rusty Wallace staged a back and forth battle for the crown, a young hotshot named Jeff Gordon embarked on his rookie season with Hendrick Motorsports. Boy, he sure is tearing up a lot of race cars, there's no way he lasts in the Winston Cup Series, right? Kowicki and Davey Allison both figured to be in contention for the championship again, but tragedy struck both men with Kowicki losing his life in a plane crash en route to Bristol in March, and Allison losing his in a helicopter accident in the infield at Talladega later on. It was a deeply tragic time for NASCAR, and after the season wrapped up in Atlanta, just one year removed from Kowicki and Allison being involved in the best championship finale ever, Earnhardt and Wallace paid their respects after the final race. 1994 saw the first Brickyard 400 at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. NASCAR had already passed open wheel racing as America's favorite, but the emergence of that race's winner Jeff Gordon, the continued careers of the favorites of the 80s like Earnhardt and Elliott, and American open wheel splitting itself in two ensured that NASCAR would go unimposed into the new millennium. Even with Gordon's utter dominance in the latter half of the 90s, NASCAR continued to explode in popularity. Huge companies sponsored cars, the manufacturers fought week in and week out to get aero adjustments to help them compete, and the drivers were generally entertaining guys. You had drivers you either loved or hated, like Gordon, Earnhardt, and Rusty. You had the very popular older vets like Mark Martin and Dale Jarrett. And you had the slightly younger guys finding their footing and competing at the front, like Jeff Burton and Bobby Labonte. And it wasn't just the Cup Series anymore. What was once the late model sportsman series for years and years was now the Bush Grand National Series. And NASCAR had even started a truck series in 1995 to capture the growing pickup truck market in the United States. All of their races too were on TV and it was just more NASCAR everywhere you looked. ESPN and CBS had done a lot of the heavy lifting getting NASCAR to this point, but for 2001, NASCAR signed a multi-billion dollar agreement with Fox, NBC, and TNT. The first race of that season ultimately became the biggest turning point in the sport's history. On the final lap of the 2001 Daytona 500, Dale Earnhardt was involved in an accident and sadly passed away. He was unfortunately not the first, but after this race, the mission became to make sure he would be the last. This was the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. NASCAR would end up investigating how they could use Dr. Robert Hubbard's head and neck restraint, or Hans device, and the safer barrier created by the University of Nebraska and the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. 
Within two full seasons of Earnhardt's passing, the Hans device was mandatory and the safer barrier found itself at every NASCAR track. This era coincided with an entirely new crop of young stars. Dale Earnhardt Jr. led the charge on that front, instantly becoming the most popular driver after his father's passing. But we also had the likes of Tony Stewart, Matt Kenseth, Kevin Harvick, Jimmy Johnson, Kurt and Kyle Busch, Ryan Newman, Greg Biffle, Casey Kane, Danny Hamlin, Carl Edwards. I mean, the list is pretty long. By the end of 2002, the guys that made up this generation of driver started to replace the likes of Jarrett, Burton, Elliott, and Labonte towards the top of the point standings. 2003 saw the end of both Winston as title sponsor in the Cup Series, as well as the last for a season-long points format. In 2004, Nextel replaced Winston, and NASCAR instituted the first version of the Chase for the Cup. For the final 10 races, the top 10 in points would be reset, and they'd have their own mini-season to determine the champion. I'd say that most people who were old enough to watch before 2004 have never liked it. NASCAR introduced the Car of Tomorrow in 2007, something much safer than before. But man, those things were ugly. Who decided to put a rear wing on a stock car? And don't get me started on those splitters with the bolts on them. I get shivers down my spine whenever I come across a picture of one of those things these days. A lot of the 2000s also came with race procedure changes, with things like the Lucky Dog, which gave the first car a lap down a free pass back onto the lead lap when a caution came out, double file restarts meant to generate excitement, and overtime, which extended the race past the scheduled distance to try to get a green flag finish. And then there's the infamous debris yellows. In this era, NASCAR would throw random debris yellows to bunch up the field when it got boring. All these gimmicks plus the 2008 recession, and people stopped going, stopped watching. Jimmy Johnson winning 5 straight titles in the most boring way possible, and thanks to the chase format, ruined all momentum NASCAR had. You'd think they'd learn their lesson, but no. In 2014, they just doubled down on the chase, and decided to call it the playoffs, because god forbid NASCAR tries to not be like regular sports. It's almost as if auto racing is different from football or basketball. They made it a 16 driver bracket, and even worse than the original chase, they have a one race championship at the end to the highest finisher in the final four. I mean, just typing this out on the script raises my blood pressure, so I'm going to move on. TV viewership and track attendance kept on declining. Brian France, who took over in 2003 and started all these changes, was ousted in 2018. 2020 was an interesting time with the world illness, and NASCAR took the opportunity to change things up into the future. More road courses, the return of long forgotten tracks like North Wilkesboro, tracks that never got a cup race in their original run like Nashville and Gateway, and even a street course in downtown Chicago. 2022 saw the current generation of race car finally putting an end to the car of tomorrow and its various iterations. The car has been better on intermediate tracks like Charlotte and Kansas, but worse on road courses and short tracks, which uh, kind of sucks because of the push NASCAR's made towards adding more road courses and short tracks to the schedule. If they get that fixed and possibly do a real championship format, seriously, I'm begging them, I think they're in a good place. The last 20 years have been an exhibition on how to shoot yourself in the foot, and it's only recently that they're trying to fix some things. After years of wondering who the next stars will be, a lot of them have finally come into their own. Kyle Larson, Chase Elliott, and Ryan Blaney all won titles, and there's plenty of other guys to root for. There's a driver for everyone, and even more coming up through the ranks. That was a quick history of NASCAR. I'm sure I'll have people in the comments telling me who and what I skipped over, and that's fine. This was just an outline of the history of the company itself, not so much on the race cars or any particular driver. But if you did like this, leave a like and subscribe for more content. I have a ton of video ideas that will be in the works soon, and I hope to see you all then. Thank you.